So today, I'm very pleased to welcome to this podcast, Dr. Stray J.C. Fong, the former Attorney General of Sarawak. He's actually written a few books dealing with federal state relations. Uh, the most recent one, if I'm not mistaken, was published by the law publisher, uh, Sweet and Maxwell. It deals with constitutional federalism in Sarawak. So Dr. Stray, thank you very much for appearing on my podcast. As I mentioned to you, I'm trying to speak to as many experts as possible about issues relating to the Malaysia Agreement 63. As you know, this has caused a fair bit of controversy, especially in Sabah and Sarawak. And there are many, many groups out there who claim that, you know, because of the unhappiness over MS-63, perhaps uh, they should seek a legal remedy under international law. Can I have your opinion on this issue? Well, first, what sort of remedies are we thinking about? Secondly, what remedies are available at international law in terms of trying to enforce a treaty like the Malaysia Agreement, which no doubt is registered as a treaty with the United Nations? And also, which tribunal international tribunal is able to grant any remedy that can be enforced. Uh, so th these are the problems that we have in terms of seeking remedies for what m some people say have been a breach of the Malaysia Agreement as an international treaty. And then there is the other point, who has the local standi to go and seek this remedy? And who are we going to uh, name as respondent to any such proceedings? I don't think the UK government wants to be a party to it anymore. As far as they are concerned, they have granted us independence and they have passed the Malaysia Act in the UK Parliament to waste sovereignty as per agreed in the Malaysia Agreement and also to vest all the rights to properties, assets in Sarawak, which was under the colonial administration of the state of Sarawak in the new state of Sarawak as a state within the federation. So they have given us back everything that they previously had. So now, uh, uh, that is the, the, the issue that we have now. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, under international law, the remedy, uh, as you mentioned, is probably quite difficult. The other thing to note, of course, is that uh, if you want to appear under ICJ, it will only take cases from sovereign states, as you know, and only sovereign states yes, can appear. Uh, the, so that's the, another big hurdle, yes. But yeah. a lot of people got very excited last year uh, because they claimed that there was actually a precedence now because there was an advisory opinion issued by the ICJ in relation to a thing called the Chagos case. Uh, do you, have you uh, read about this case? And is it, in your opinion, yes, a legal I opinion? I read about yeah. this case. Yes. Uh, let's get to the bottom of it, okay? The circumstances are different. But before we come to that, before we can go to the ICJ, the parties must submit to its jurisdiction. Otherwise, we end up like the dispute between China and Philippines. Although Philippines got a judgment in its favor, the Chinese government does not recognize it. Yeah, sorry, so I thought, can I just come in here? Uh, for those of you who are not aware of this, this is the Philippines government trying to sue China over the issues of uh, the South China Sea, especially yeah. the claim by China over a thing called the Nine Dash Lines. And I'll put a link at the bottom of this podcast if you want to read more about it. Sorry, Dato, go ahead. Okay. Now, insofar as the situation in Sarawak, and for that matter, Sabah as well, all right, uh, the process of uh, getting the people of the two states to agree 
to join the Federation of Malaysia was undertaken before the Malaysia Agreement was signed. Now, whatever may be the defect or shortcoming of those fact-finding missions, including one by the United Nations uh, just before Malaysia Day. Their findings do show that the majority of the population of the two Borneo states agree to be part of the Federation. In June 1963, there were local elections conducted under what was then known as the three-tier system. The municipal level, the divisional level, and then the council agree. The outcome of the election shows also that the majority of the people, or at least the elected representatives, were in favor of Malaysia. Uh, then the British, in accordance to their normal practice, granted a self government on the 22nd of July, 1963, with our own chief minister and our own cabinet sworn in on that day. So effectively, what happens was that the self-governing uh, or the, the, the government, which has the uh, executive authority to a large extent over the state at that time, took the decision to pass a motion in the Council Negri, which effectively agreed to the formation of Malaysia and ratifying the Malaysian agreement which was signed by its representatives in London. All right. So with all this, it is difficult to argue that we are in the same position as the other case. Uh, and I think if we take all those factors into consideration, it is difficult to unwind what has been decided already. Uh, by our forefathers. It's a maybe imperfect arrangement, but then in this world, nothing is perfect. It is up to us, you know, to make it work and to make sure that whatever has been agreed in 1963 are duly honored by the federal government of today. Which brings me to the next question. Obviously, this unhappiness uh, uh, in Sabah and Surau over federal state relationship, uh, there must be some basis to it. People feel that they're being bullied by the federal government. They feel that the federal government has not kept to this issue of uh, autonomy for Sabah and Surau. If the international route is not available, are there any legal remedies uh, in the domestic area, in the domestic Malaysian courts? Well, the Malay Malaysian courts, when they have the opportunity, tried to see that the Malaysian, that, that what was agreed in the Malaysia agreement and what was agreed to be the special safeguards for the interests of uh, the special interests of Sabah and Sarawak are duly honored. You know, you, many have heard of the case of the Sabah case at Robert Lingi, where Justice uh, David Wong says that, you know, Malaysian who are in some way agreed by the way the Malaysian agreement is implemented may take the matter to court. Of course, on appeal, the courts decided that maybe Robert Lingi didn't have the local standard. Mm -hmm. All right. So, one must uh, take comfort from that judgment that if somebody has the local standard, they can go to the courts and seek remedy for any breach of the Malaysia agreement 
or of course the states themselves, I will come to that later, you know, has a way to do it. Now, I think there are some other cases as well, like the case of uh, Dr. Tinzek C and Dr. Tufel Mahmoud over the uh, rights of audience by West Malaysian lawyers before the courts of Sabah and Sarawak, including if the case originating from Sabah and Sarawak were to be heard in Putrajaya. And they denied, uh, now Tan Sri Thomas, Tommy Thomas, the right to appear in that case, even though it was scheduled to be heard in Kuala Lumpur. And then there is, uh, you know, Suguma Parakrishnan's uh, immigration matter, where, you know, the autonomy of the Sabah and Sarawak over immigration was upheld quite forcefully. So I think overall, the, when the case is properly made up for, to the courts to safeguard the special interests of Sabah and Sarawak, the courts will not uh, fail to uphold them. Okay. The unhappiness, of course, occurred because, you know, as time goes by, with a new breed of politicians coming, new administrators, uh, they tend to forget about, you, you know, the, the special rights, safeguards and privileges that were uh, accorded to the Borneo states, you know, and uh, with the result, you know, there is, it, it is true that to some extent there had been an erosion of these rights. For instance, tourism, you know, on Malaysia Day, it was not a subject matter in any of the legislative list. And then when they want to amend the federal constitution in 1994, they took it from the residual list you know, and put it into the federal list, not even onto the concurrent mm. list. So that deprived, you know, Sabah, which has a vast interest in tourism, and Sarawak, which is trying to establish its own tourism industry, suffered a big setback. So uh, there are things like that. And, uh, you know, there are provisions in the constitution for some executive authority to be transferred to the states of Sabah and Sarawak. And for federal to fund the uh, performance of these executive duties or responsibilities on behalf of the federal government. And if the money given to do so is not enough, it will be brought before a tribunal appointed by the Chief Justice of Malaysia. All these structures are in place. But they've never been used. Uh, well, we have been asking for it since the time of Tan, the late uh, Pehin Sri Adinan, because we felt that, you know, the education system was not good enough. The schools were left in the dilapidated states and uh, with no money to rehabilitate them. The health service left much to be desired and the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic exposes many of these shortcomings. So, you, you know, there had to be some degree of decentralization. Now this in brings order me, to, Sorry? Sure. Now I understand. Now, now this brings me to the next point. When you talk about decentralization, I'm assuming you're talking about the federal government response to, to the unhappiness, which is uh, starting from uh, uh, Najib's uh, premiership. He started a, a committee dealing with uh, MS63 issues. Then under the PH government, they also set up a cabinet level committee to deal with these issues. 
I'm assuming that uh, you think that this is a good way of handling the issues or you think that uh, this is just another way to, to, you know, to decouple the legal issues from the political issues. I mean, I mean, what is your thinking with all these federal committee? Because when you look at the sort of issues that discuss, right, more than half of the issues are not even part of the MS-63 thing. A lot of it is administrative, decentralized issues like you, like you mentioned. It is not, well, number one, two administrations have said that they want to look into, you know, how to, uh, the, the grievances of the state of Sabah and Sarawak to reclaim some of their laws, rights or autonomy. All right. Both administrations publicly say that they would want to see a good solution achieved. I had always been a skeptic to this because I don't see much, I mean, I'm being quite frank. Uh, I've been involved in it for many years in this exercise. There must have been a political will to implement what has been agreed, you know, to resolve these grievances. Somehow or other, it falls into the same uh, sort of malice or, you know, problem that we see in Malaysia. As I always say, in Malaysia, there are a lot of task force. They have tasks but no force. You know, they can say whatever they want, but when it comes to implementation, there is not the political will to do it on the part of the federal government. We brought up the issue that under the Malaysia Act, any land that on Malaysia Day was reserved for federal purpose, if no longer used for federal purpose, it should be returned to the state. That has not been done. On the contrary, the federal government wants to use this land, even when the agencies are privatized for so their own me, development. So let me cut in. So why doesn't the Sarawak state government challenge this in the courts? Well, we are not ruling out anything. Uh, we have taken them to court. Petronas, I mean, on the sales tax issue. Uh, they have tried to prevent us from using our state law to, re regular, to regulate the oil and gas industry. We have resisted that and they failed. So uh, we'll see what develops next. What, what about I the plan? I can't, I'm just, uh, I take instructions. Sure, I understand. But you know, are, are I you, take instructions. Yes, I yes. cannot uh, do anything which I'm not instructed to do. Sure. I also want to make it clear, I'm, I'm inviting you here in your personal capacity, not, not on behalf of the Sarawak State mm -hmm. Government. Uh, the other thing I want to, to, to ask you is that, as you know, right, a lot of activists out there are claiming that the PDA 1974, the Petronas Act, is actually illegal and that Sarawak should have nothing to do with it. The argument is that the chief minister at that time do not have the authority to sign away the rights of oil and gas because he did not bring the thing to the uh, Dewan Undangan Negeri. Can I have your legal view on this? Well, the PDA's legality or constitutionality has been a contentious issue for many decades. All right, there are arguments on both sides, you know. Uh, so some take the view from the state that the PDA, which seeks to vest rights over minerals and land within the boundaries of Sarawak, 
in Petronas is in a way an expropriatory law, which under Article 13.2 of the Federal Constitution requires an adequate compensation for such measures to be constitutionally valid. All right. Uh, nobody can say that the 5% cash payment is adequate compensation. It is never represented as such in any of the documents that were signed in 1975. Secondly, the PDA affects the natural resources on land, which is the property of the state before Malaysia Day or within the boundaries of the state. That measure is unconstitutional because federal parliament simply don't have this power. The counter argument is there's a vesting order signed by the then chief minister. Well, whether that vest, vesting order has the effect of an absolute vesting of all the rights of petroleum in Petronas is itself a contentious issue. Among the points of contentions are, can't Petronas just exercise those rights without compliance with the state law. The state law under the oil mining ordinance, a pre-Malaysia law, which continues to in, be enforced after Malaysia because of section 73 of the Malaysia Act says, nobody can mine oil in Sarawak and its continental shelf without a mining lease. So Petronas has never had within its PDA provisions exemptions not to comply with state law. The only exemption given to Petronas is that it did not have to comply with the Petroleum Mining Act 1966 uh, of uh, the Federation of Malaysia. That act doesn't apply to Sarawak. So these are all these points in contentions needs to be resolved. I myself had proposed to two federal AGs, Tan Sri Apandi Ali and Tan Sri Tommy Thomas, to say, let us clear up these issues. One of two ways. One is we go to the court, the federal court that is, for the federal court to exercise its original jurisdiction to decide this dispute between the Federation and the state under Article 1281B of the Federal Constitution. Or if we want to have a more friendly type of litigation, go and seek the advisory opinion of the Federal Court under Article 130. These suggestions of mine, you know, were just brushed off because they were not willing to submit this issue for a judicial interpretation or ruling. That would have settled the matter once and for all. And when the judicial decision is reached, then the political leadership can decide what to do. Then the obvious question is that why don't Sarawak seek a judicial, uh, what do you call, answer to this question on its own? Why do we need to, to consult the federal uh, agency? Well, I think number one, we have to get leave of the federal court in order to launch it unilaterally. Well, we don't have leave because we are the government, you know, but we still want, we can, 
we can do that on our own, but I am not the one to make the decision. As I told you, I only act on instructions. I understand. The remedy is available to us. Do we want to pursue? On a personal level, I think it is time to put this issue to rest by getting a definitive ruling from the highest court of the country. Whichever way the decision goes, doesn't matter. At least there is clarity and there is an opportunity for the political leadership at federal and state level to see how the matter should be dealt with after you know the federal court has given its opinion mm -hmm. that would be the way, best way to resolve this otherwise there are a lot of statements and opinion expressed outside there some of which i find to be quite hilarious to say the least can I ask whether this position that you've just suggested, uh, going to the federal court to get a definitive uh, answer, is this the same position taken by, uh, by the legal, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the legal people in Sabah, or is this uh, primarily a Sarawak thing? Well, when I proposed this, the Sabahan people were, the Sabah people were around. They neither object, no support. Usually Sabah let Sarawak do all the work first, like in the case of the SST issue. Mm. The, the underlying assumption is that whatever applies to Sarawak will eventually apply to Sabah as well. Yeah. Can I ask you uh, finally uh, one final question? Uh, given all these legal remedies that have not been taken, as you said, for the last 50 years, and there was hardly any political will, what do you think is the best way forward in terms of federal state relationship since since we know in the last 10 years uh the number of of activists has actually grown substantially because of the rise of social media uh they are more no, sorry, i was interrupted by this phone. that's all right that's all right that's all right i was just yeah. going to ask you given the fact that you've, you've you've outlined very clearly that a lot of the legal remedies that are there are not taken up and there's a lack of political will, at least at the federal level, to do something about it. What is the way forward, given the fact that with the rise of social media, more and more people are angry about this issue? Well, I don't have an answer to that. You know? And uh, I want to stay out of political controversy. Uh, it is... I can only point out to the way forward. But whether my advice is taken up or not, that is a different matter. Mm, 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 okay. Mm. I, I, my policy is always, I advise, it's up to people whether they want to take my advice on board on what they are doing or not. All right. I don't force my advice on people. My, my final question relates to the highly controversial thing that happened last year in April. Uh, as you know, right, the federal parliament under PH administration was trying to amend symbolically uh, putting the wording back to the 1963 wording. Uh, it's obvious speaking to many lawyers, they said that even if you change the wording back, it's purely for symbolic. There is no, uh, what do you call it? There is no uh, meat to, to, to that wording. Do you think that under this new government, uh, Sabah and Sarawak should still pursue this change in wording or as the Sarawak side wanted, which is to add an additional words like pursue to the Malaysia Act? Uh, speaking as a legal person, uh, what is your opinion? Well, for myself, an amendment to Article 1-2 makes no difference because our rights, our special safeguards, our autonomy would not have been addressed by just, as you said, symbolically changing Article 1-2. Our State Assembly has put up a bill 
a proposed bill for amendment of the federal constitution. We have passed this over to the former minister of law, Dr. V.K. Liu of Sabah. Uh, unfortunately, although he said the matter will be brought up in April this year, it has not uh, materialized because of the change of government. Basically, we want to have more than just an amendment of Article 1-2 or pursuing to the federal uh, Malaysia agreement or whatever it is. You know, we want to incorporate there, among other things, to put tourism in the concurrent lease together with environment. Uh, we want some uh, reinforcement into the provisions of the return of land to the state and so on and so forth and certain native issues. Uh, it is on record in the state assemblies answered on what the contents of the bill ought to be. Uh, I'm not sure whether the present government will want to entertain it. Uh, whatever it is, it might be difficult now because the present government doesn't have a clear-cut majority to and pass sure. to pass uh, the a constitutional amendment bill. And I think if the widely accepted bill in Kuala Lumpur is that the present government is is getting or putting the groundwork, they're more worried about the next general elections rather than issues dealing with Sabah and Sarawak. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yes. can, can, I I <laughs> can I ask you another direct Can I just ask you another direct question? Given that the fact that there, there are suggestions such as this, was this amendments or slate of amendments, was this brought up in the in the cabinet level committee that was set up by the PH government or that they, they only dealt with administrative decentralization issue? No. We put in it officially at the, that time the steering committee which was a level below the uh, cabinet committee. Cabinet committee. Yeah, yeah. It was a joint committee chaired by the then Attorney General and Dr. V. K. Liu. Mm -hmm. It was there, we officially uh, handed it in. It was minuted. And subsequently, we got information that uh, they want to table a bill or which incorporate uh, some or all of what we propose into a constitutional amendment bill in the April or March sitting of this year, mm. but that never materialized mm. or had not materialized. Talking about not materialized, um, many people are also saying that one of the reasons why everything has sort of uh, not gone according to plan was that uh, it was very clear that uh, Sabah Sarawak and the federal government were supposed to meet 10 years after Malaysia was formed in 1973, but that meeting never went ahead. Why is that the Sarawak government never asked for that meeting to be convened? No, I, I think the only thing that constitutionally required to do was a five yearly review of the special grants. That's right, yep and revenue sources that are given to the two states. That stopped in the 70s. That stopped in the 70s. We had, uh, during my tenure in 1997, we brought this matter up when Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim was the finance minister. He said at the meeting that he wanted his secretary general to deal with the matter, and we heard nothing. So at the onset of the current negotiations during Tan Sri Adinan's time, this was one of the top issue we brought up. Uh, there was, they said it was a deal, they want to review it, together with other claims that we had, like stamp duty, you know, 
online transactions and so on. They want to review it. We even drafted the procedure or the procedural rules for such review to take place. Sabah agreed to it. And somehow or other, the uh, finance ministry, that time under Mr. Ling Guang Eng, did not agree. And then the finance minister in his last budget suddenly say he top up the grant, the special grant by a certain sum. Mm -hmm. You know? Without so, calling for a meeting, without calling for a meeting, he just increased the, the grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was not a proper review. Mm -hmm. So that is the issue. So I may have to terminate because somebody is looking for me urgently. That's all right. Well, I, I know you're very busy, uh, Dr. Street. So thank you very much for appearing in this podcast. Thank you.